Good morning, New Life. This is the day that the Lord has made, and be glad in it. So let us open in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to stand in your presence this morning. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would empty each of us of ourselves. May we be filled with you. We ask, Holy Spirit, that you would cleanse us, open us, our hearts, open our eyes, and give us ears to hear. Heavenly Father, we ask that everything that uh, is spoken today would come forth in your power and in your might. And we pray that you would be glorified today. And we ask it, Jesus, in your mighty and in your matchless name. Amen. So, some folks may be wondering, how did I wind up here? Like, where did this guy come from a year ago? So I was invited to the teaching team, and we're all sitting around, and we're talking about where we came from. And Michael Mancino says, oh, I live in East Patchogue. And I'm like, oh, I, I grew up in East Patchogue. My dad lives on Munsell Road. I used to live on 135 Orchard Road. Tanya says, did you just say 135 Orchard Road? I said, yeah, uh-huh. Is it okay? I live there. <laughs> I live there. And then... I said, my son, who's now 40, used to come to the after-school program and, and during the day school program, and Michael Mancino's mom knows my son. And I'm also here because of someone who is very special to my heart, to Maura and to Brian, and that's Maura. And uh, she was part of our Bible study, and she just said, Gene, you need to come to this church. And so I think you cannot make this up. This is divine providence. This is something that God is doing, and so we just give it up to him. But this morning, we are in this, uh, the sermon series. Uh, we are going through the names of God. In week one, Fred gave us a great introduction. He asked us to reflect upon names, because names give us depth. They have meaning. They have purpose. And so he asked us to reflect on maybe a childhood name, a current name. And so I'm sitting, and I'm like, oh, my gosh. My name is Eugene Guy Tarver Jr., my dad senior, so I used to be called Little Gene. And I was Little Gene for like the longest time, and I'm like, okay. Then week two, Tanya presented two names, and those two names were Jehovah Suri, which is the Lord is my rock, and the second name was Jehovah Uzi, and she told us that it came from Israel, from the Uzi gun, but the Lord is my strength. She also gave us something to reflect upon, and that was to trust God's character. We can lean upon him. If we know God's word, we know his ways, that is what matters. And then last week, week three, Michael presented um, El Kana from what chapter? From the Ten Commandments. He reminded us that God is jealous but he also taught us that God doesn't have a jealousy that, like we have where we, we want something, maybe we're coveting something. He said, no, God's character is always good. And in fact, I'm reminded when Jesus uh, was with the, uh, the, young, the young man that um, had a lot of money, and Jesus said, why do, you, why do you say or why do you ask me what's good? Jesus said, for there is one who's good. But he taught us that God is jealous for us. He wants a relationship with us. He wants us to put nothing above him. And today, today we're in week four. And today we're going to meet Moses, who while wandering in the wilderness, he's going to meet the three M's. And you may be thinking, three M's? What does that mean? So some background, because we cannot just get into Exodus 3, 14. But who was Moses? Moses was the most important person in the Old Testament. In fact, he was the person who spoke about the coming Messiah. In fact, John 5.46, Jesus said, if you believed in Moses, you would believe in me. Why? Because he wrote about me. Moses was born to a Levite couple. They were godly. His father's name was Amran. His mother's name was Jacobed or Jacobed. He had a brother named Aaron, and his sister was Miriam. In fact, you can find that genealogy in Numbers Chapter 26, verse 59. Key thing, Moses 
was under God's divine providence from his birth. Now, what is divine providence? That means that God's love, God's wisdom, he directs and controls everything in the universe. But we know from Exodus chapter 2 that Pharaoh gave an edict to throw the baby boys into the Nile. But the godly couple, what did they do? They hid him for three months, and when they couldn't do it no more, they sent him down the river. Now here is divine providence. Who found Moses? And Scripture tells us, let's turn to Exodus chapter 2, and if you would read with me, Exodus chapter 2, 5 through 10. Exodus chapter 2, verses 5 through 10, because here is divine providence. Exodus 2, verse 5 through 10, reading from the NIV. Scripture says that Pharaoh's daughter went to the Nile to bathe, and her attendants were walking along the riverbank. She saw a basket among the reeds, and she sent her female to get it. She opened and saw the baby. He was crying. She felt sorry. Take this baby, and I will pay you. So the woman took the baby and nursed him. When the baby grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter, and she became her son. She named him Moses. She gave him a name because she said, I drew him out of water. Let me ask a question. Why couldn't Pharaoh's daughter bring this baby that she named Moses a father? It would violate her father's command. He was the one who said, all Hebrew babies must be thrown into the water. But here's divine providence. Moses' sister was close by to offer that suggestion. Pharaoh's daughter gives a command to say, go. Here it is. Moses' mother is now hired to raise him. She's being paid to raise her own son. And Moses is now protected under Pharaoh's daughter because she adopts him and gives him a name. In fact, scholars say that um, he was about 40 years old when he goes out to see his people and he witnesses an Egyptian beating one of the Hebrew taskmasters. What does Moses do? God uses amazing people. What did Moses do? He killed the Egyptian taskmaster and buries him in the sand. Then Moses flees from his Egyptian life and goes to the wilderness of Midian. Exodus is one of my favorite books beside the Gospel of John because it has three major sections. Exodus is about the rescue from human bondage. And the New Testament, though, is about rescue from sin's bondage. The second thing Exodus does, it tells us about the law, the Ten Commandments. The third, and I think is the most important, is the tabernacle. Because the tabernacle was created and established by God, so his chosen people, you and I, will know how to worship him we will know the promises of his presence, and we will know the holiness of God. Exodus also shows us three major attributes of God. God's miracles, God's power, that God is the Savior. Exodus, from beginning to end, shows us bondage to glory. I want to repeat that. Exodus teaches us about bondage and glory. Is there someone else in Scripture that can bring you and I from bondage to glory? So let me set the scene. Let's set the scene. You're Moses, and so after you murder the Egyptian, you leave the palace and you head off to the wilderness. Sounds like a good plan. Like, all right, I'm, I'm going to get away. So you're a wandering Hebrew shepherd. You're living life large. You, the tumbleweeds, some sandstorms, some cattle. You get married and you have a son. Life is good. No pharaoh, no Egyptian police. Just the peace of the wilderness. Now, let's go to our text. <laughs> Exodus chapter 3, 1 through 6. So here's Moses wandering in the wilderness. Now Moses was tending the flock of his Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, 
And he led the flock to the far side, to the wilderness, or the far side of the wilderness, and came to Horeb, and that is known as Mount Sinai, the Mount of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within the bush. Moses saw that the bush was on fire. It didn't burn up. So Moses thought, hey, I'll go see this strange sight, why the bush doesn't burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called him from within the bush. Moses, Moses. Can I ask you guys a question? Why is it when God speaks to men, he always calls us twice? Why is that? I don't find in Scripture that he calls women two times, only us. Moses, Moses, Samuel, Samuel, Saul, Saul, Jean, Jean, you know, wake up. But no, in fact, um, when God would call people twice, it was a sign of affection that he wanted a relationship. There was a purpose behind him calling Moses twice, Samuel twice, Saul twice. There was a purpose behind that. Let's continue. Verse 5. Well, Moses says, here I am. Verse 5. God says, do not come any closer. Take your sandals off, because where you're standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father. I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face. Interesting. Moses hid his face. Verse 5, do not come any closer. God says, remove your sandals. In fact, during that time period, if you were to remove your sandals, it was a sign of respect. If you were entering the presence of a superior or a tent of a superior, you were called to remove your sandals. Scripture reference, Joshua 5, 15, and also in Matthew 3, 14, John the Baptist says, I... I'm not worthy to untie his sandals. Then verse 6, God says to, to Moses, I am the God of your father. Here's a Bible quiz. Who remembers what Moses' name was? Any takers? No? Uh-oh. Jethro? Amron. Amron was his father. Chapter 6, verse 20 gives you the answer to that. But there is a couple of key points in these verses when God is speaking to Moses. God wants Moses to understand that he is speaking to the true God. God wants Moses to know that he is now joining the divine relationship of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Remember, Moses grew up in a Levite home. But Moses hid his face from God. Again, there's some Near Eastern culture that would say that if you were to look at a God face to face, your life would be in danger. But Moses was surrounded in the Egyptian culture with idols, but not the one true God. In fact, if you recall from Genesis, God never reveals his true name to Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob, but he does appear to them many times. In fact, if you recall, when Jacob was wrestling with God in Exodus 32, he asked for a name. God doesn't answer, but he changes Jacob's name from Jacob to Israel. Let's finish continuing the verses. Let's read now 7 through 10. Verses 7 through 10. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because they're slave drivers, and I'm concerned about their suffering. God said, so I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and bring them up to a land, a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Now that milk and that honey, that was more likely goat's milk, and the honey was not the honey that you and I have. That honey was probably from figs and raisins, a little different um, but God is saying, I'm bringing you to a, a better place, a land flowing with milk and honey. And he says, I'm going to bring you to the home of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. I don't know how many ites there needs to be more in Scripture, but there's a lot of them. 
And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, God said, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now I am sending you to Pharaoh. Go bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. There are some words that God wants our attention. The word misery. The word crying out. The word slave driver. Suffering. Maybe this is you this morning. Maybe one of us fits in one of these categories. Maybe we're in one, two, or three of them. Maybe we're in all of them. I mean, after the news that we heard, this nation is suffering. But can I ask you, how did the Hebrews wind up in Egypt? God brought them there. He brought them there to save them from a famine. He wanted to save his people, but something changed. Something drastically changed from God bringing the Hebrews into Egypt. The Pharaoh that supported Joseph was no longer in power. The Pharaoh that welcomed Jacob and his family and his brothers was gone. Their situation has radically changed. Maybe something has changed in your life. Maybe today you may feel lost. You may feel alone. Maybe you might feel hopeless. But remember what God said. I have seen. I have heard. And I'm concerned. Scripture tells us God wants us to understand that he sees you. He sees you in every one of your situations. He's not far off. He's in our midst. He hears our prayers. He wants us to cry out to him. God is concerned about you. God wants to have a relationship with you and I. God wants us to trust him. God wants us to lean upon him. He is our rock. He is our strong tower. Psalm 18, verse 2 says this, and I think during prayer someone spoke of it. Psalm 18, verse 2 The Lord is my rock and my fortress, my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge. He's my shield and the horn of my salvation, the strength of my salvation, my stronghold. Four points, my rock, my deliverer, my shield, and my salvation. Also, Psalm 25 tells us this in verse 4 and 5. Psalm 25, verse 4 and 5. Show me your paths, or show me your ways, Lord. Teach me your path. Guide me in your truth, and teach me. Sounds like a, sounds like a song. Sounds like a song. Maybe third day. Show me your ways, Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth, and teach me. For you are God my Savior. My hope is in you all day long. Four things. Your ways, your path, your truth. You are my God and my hope all day day long. Now let's go and finish the rest of Scripture. Go back to Exodus chapter 3, verses 11 through 14. Exodus 3, 11 through 14. Should be up on the screen. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Lord, who am I that I should go and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? God said, I'll be with you. And this will be a sign to you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses said, I love Moses. Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask, what is his name. Then what should I tell him? What should I tell him? If you remember Moses, if you're Moses, can you imagine the shock? Moses says, who should I say sent him? God said, I am who I am. 
This is what you ought to say to the Israelites, I am as sent you. So if you're Moses, can you imagine God saying, hey, I want you to go back to Pharaoh. But I was leading a peaceful life. I was a normal shepherd. But yet out of nowhere, God appears to him in a burning bush. Then he gives a command to take off his sandals. And now you want me to go back to Pharaoh? If I were Moses, you may be thinking too, if I were Moses, I don't want to go back there. I just committed murder back there. You want me to go back to Pharaoh? Oh, and you want me to lead all of these people out of Egypt? Pharaoh is certainly not going to roll the red carpet out for me. I don't know if I want to go back there. But Moses, he has two objections. He says, God, who am I? And the second is, who are you? Who are you? You show up in a burning bush. But in ancient times, a name was more than an identifying label. Your name was your essence. Your name was your essence. It was what you were all about. It was your, about your identity rather than your identification. So to ask for Moses to say, God, what is your name? He said, God, what are you all about? What do you stand for? This is important because God said, I will be with you. I will be with you. And when you have brought this people out, you will worship God on this mountain. We must read Scripture slow. It's very important. Because in this verse, he gives us three promises. God says, I'm going to be with you. Moses and the Israelites will soon see God's majesty. He doesn't know when, but soon he will see God's majesty. God said, you're going to bring the people out of Egypt. Moses and the Israelites will soon see God's magnificent power. And then God said, you're going to worship God on this mountain. Moses and the Israelites will soon see that God's name is matchless. They're going to see his majesty. They're going to see his magnificent power. His majesty, when they create the temple, they're going to see this majestic God that he says, you're going to worship me on this mountain. They're going to see the magnificent power when he parts the Red Sea and he sends ten plagues to free his people from serving Pharaoh so that they can serve the living God. God is jealous for us. He sent the plagues so the people of Israel, the Israelites, would not worship Pharaoh, but they wanted, God wanted him to worship him. But where were the people? They were enslaved to Pharaoh. And where did Moses come from? He was a baby rescued from the Nile River. He was a wandering shepherd. During this conversation with the burning bush, Moses wondered, so what God am I talking to when God said, remove your sandals, you're standing on holy ground? Having lived in the midst of an Egyptian pagan culture, he was exposed to all kinds of idols. And while wandering around in a wilderness is why he asked in, in verse 13, if I go to the Israelites and ask, what is his name? Who is this God that speaks to me? And in this series, we see and we'll learn more about the many names of God. A few of them, El Elron, God Most High. El Roy, the God who sees. And everyone knows El Shaddai, God Almighty. El Elron, Genesis 14, 18 through 22. The God who sees me, speaking of Hagar and Ishmael. Genesis 16, 13. And El Shaddai, Chapter 17 of Genesis, the covenant that God made with Abraham. So when God said, I am who I am, God is telling Moses, you can trust me because of my name. Names have a significance. God is saying, you can trust me. I am what I am. I am who I am. I will be what I will be, and I will be who I will be. And here's a big word. Theologians call this the acidity of God, meaning that God is independent. God is self-existent. God is the uncaused cause. He is the creator. He is the uncreator. You can't create God. God is the source of all things. This is what gets me excited. He is the source of all things. God is the one who originated everything. Ex nihilo, out of nothing, God created in fact, when God created man, God got his hands dirty. 
he reached down and created us from the very dust of the ground, and he breathed life into us. The same God who got his hands dirty when he created us is the same God who bled on the cross. The same God. You can trust me. God hears you. God sees you. God knows you. He is the creator. He is the one who sustains you today. The very air that we breathe comes from our heavenly father. He is the one in whom all other things exist, find their source and continuance. He is the ever-present, majestic, magnificent, matchless power that sustains you and I today and every day until Jesus comes again. Some scriptures that kind of support God's word and when God says, I am who I am. Isaiah 45, verses 5 and 12 says this. I am the Lord, there is no other. Apart from me, there is no God. I will strengthen you, though you have not acknowledged me. How many times in Scripture that the Israelites continue to wander and commit idolatry with the Baals and the Asherahs and all the pagan cultures, they would break God's heart. But God said, it is I who made the earth and created mankind on it. My own hands, my hands got dirty when he made you and I. My own hand stretched out the heavens. I marshaled their starry hosts. Isaiah 46 says this, verses 9 and 10. Remember the former things, those of long ago. I am God, and there is no other. I am God, there is none like me. So when Moses said, who shall I say sent me? God said, I am who I am. You will understand that I am the great I am. God said, I make known from the end from the beginning, from ancient times, what is still to come. I say my purpose will stand and I will do all that I please. Isaiah 44, 6 and 7. This is what the Lord says, Israel's king and redeemer, the Lord Almighty. I am the first and the last. Apart from me, there is no God. Sounds familiar. Didn't Jesus say, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end? I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Who then is like me? Let him proclaim it, God said. Let him declare and lay out before me what has happened since I established my ancient people. Yet what is to come? Yet let them foretell what will come. He is the great I am. And if we recall when Jesus walked on this earth and in the Gospel of John, if you haven't read fully the Gospel of John, you will clearly see the deity of Jesus. You will see his true essence. Because in the Gospel of John, he makes seven I am statements. He said, I am the bread of life. Bethel, the house of God. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door of the sheep. I am the good shepherd, he said. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. And he says, I am the vine, and you are the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing, he says. When Jesus came, he wanted the people to know that he is the I am of the Old Testament. This morning, this morning, can I ask you a question? Maybe there are, is a sandal or sandals that we need to remove to draw near to him. Why? He is the fire in our midst. His desire is to know you, and his desire is to know me, his name, his presence. Is there something that we need to remove to draw near to him, to come to the bush, to come to his fire, to come to his holiness, to take our sandals off? We live in a world that is filled with evil. We saw it last night or yesterday. We live in a world that's evil that wants to take God's word and rewrite it. They want to put it away. We want to put the Ten Commandments in school. Evil wants to take it out. There are churches that will not abide by God's word. This church is doing the right thing. If we cannot stand on this word, what can we stand upon? This world is filled with evil. And God knows that. And he knows that we are being 
pounded and pelted with all kinds of things that want to sift us like wheat. So is there something that is on your heart that you need to remove the sandals off this morning? He is majestic. He is magnificent. His name is matchless. Why? Because he is the great I am. The God who got his hands dirty is the same God that came down to be one of us. They call that the great kenosis, the self-emptying of God. And Jesus laid aside his deity and became one of us, loved us enough that he gave his life for us so that we might have it and have it more abundantly. From the beginning to the end, from when man fell in the Garden of Eden until we are going to be restored when he comes again. He is the great I am. And I would encourage you to continue to read Scripture. Read Exodus if you've never read the book of Exodus because you'll see the love of God. You can see how he interacts with his people. He delivers them from Pharaoh so that we could worship him. You see his power through the plagues. You can see his holiness through the tabernacle. And we don't have to now come to the tabernacle because the Holy Spirit dwells within us. We live and move and have our being in him. So what I would encourage you this morning, if you've never made Jesus your Savior, it's a very simple thing. What we've got to do is confess our sins, ask him to be the Lord of our life, and with a pure heart, say, Lord, come into my heart, be my king, be my Lord, be my Savior, and the Holy Spirit will come, and he'll change you from the inside beginning today. Today is the salvation. Today is the day of salvation. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that we can come to this place, to your throne, because we do stand on holy ground, Father. We wait for that day when we get to see you face to face. We wait to hear the trumpet. We, ha- we wait and we haste that day because we want to see the clouds burst open. We want to see you coming on the clouds. And so, Father, we ask that you would continue to watch over us, protect us until that day comes. We are your people. We are the people of your pasture. And I would encourage this morning, if there is something that we need to remove, some sandal, some situation that we've been holding on too long, that we would put it at the foot of your cross this morning. We ask, Holy Spirit, that you would come and ignite a fire within our heart this morning, that we might know you more. We thank you that you are the great I am. We are thankful, Lord, that you have called us by name. We are thankful, Father, that we are engraved in the palm of your hand. We are thankful, Father, that the very hairs of our head are numbered and that you know us intimately, that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And Jesus, thank you for being the same yesterday, today, and forever. Thank you for being the bright and morning star. Thank you for being the Alpha and the Omega. We can trust you this morning, Lord. Thank you for your word. Thank you for this church. And as we celebrate communion this morning, Jesus, may we reflect on what you have done for each of us. That you came to your creation, yet your creation rejected you. On the cross, you said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And so this morning, as we partake, cleanse our hearts, remove the sandals of our pride, maybe the sandals of self-righteous, maybe the sandals of some sort of sin. May we remove that this morning, that we might draw near to you. And so, Jesus, we ask all of these things today in your mighty and in your matchless name.